Amen. God bless you. You may be seated tonight. Thank you so much for standing worshiping the Lord. We do have several uh, that are not able to be here tonight. And uh, God knows their circumstances, situations. Brother and Sister Penny, uh, she's got an uncle that his cancer's back and they're doing having surgery. Actually, uh, they were either doing it this afternoon or, or this evening, but that's where they are. So let's continue to pray for Brother and Sister Penny uh, tonight and then uh, the end is for chaperoning something for Landon. Uh, for the school, so let's let's uh, pray for them that uh, God will keep His, his uh, hand on them. And then those who are not able to be here tonight, you know, let's just pray that God would touch them, brother and sister Lori. Uh, let's pray for them; they're uh, doing a lot better. But let's just continue to pray for them tonight. Amen. Yes, sister. I have a praise. All right. When Amy was here Sunday before last, um, she really got in the service, and so when she came back, she Every single day, she says, while she's working, she hears your words. Thank and she you. said for me to tell you, thank you very much. All right, praise God. Clap your hands and thank God for that. We want God to make a way. Amen. You know, I don't have such bad words. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Sister Mom. Thank you, Brother Jamal. Appreciate that. Oh, you didn't say nothing. That's right. Praise the Lord. All right. Amen. Everybody say, preparing for a work of God. Amen. Preparing for a work of God. Now, if you'll notice on your paper, it says lesson two. And we started this uh, in January. But if you'll remember, uh, we, we had it and then uh, we had a, a we canceled service due to, uh, due to bad weather on Wednesday night. And then uh, the last Wednesday night, church matters we had. Uh, we have just an all-out prayer meeting. And so uh, we've just kind of been you know, going on uh, with this. But um, last year, I really kind of, uh, I, I took different months. And I did, the theme was focused, but I did different months. You know, where I had like focus on, you know, whatever the focus was, youth. Or, you know, uh, whatever the focus was for the month. And really... I kind of put myself in the corner a little bit. I'm not saying that it was bad or negative or anything like that. But, you know, I, I want to give the Lord the liberty to be able to, to you know, speak through me to this congregation uh, for however long or short of a period of time that, that that is. And I've really been touched with this idea of consecration and with this um, uh, desire to be consecrated, if you will. And we're going to look at some things tonight that I believe will help you if you'll allow it. It'll help you and challenge you in your life in living for God. Because when we really take time to consider our lives and how we live. I mean, think about it for just a moment, if you will. Everybody just kind of do a brief little run through of your life. And, you know, from birth until right now, far back as you can remember. And just, you know, just take a few moments while I'm talking and just think about your life. Think about the overall successes and failures. Think about the things that you made that might be considered mistakes or, or things that you uh, decided to do that were that turned out to be you know, uh, a good cause, so to speak. And if you think about our lives, this life that we live, we have to admit that um, this life, first and foremost, does not belong to us. I hope we all understand that. Your life does not belong to you. Somebody say, it's the Lord's. It's the Lord's. This life doesn't belong to me. Now, you hear people say, it's my life. Now, I believe the singer was Billy Joel back in the 70s or the 80s, wrote a song. This is my life. No, it's not your life. It is not your life. You did not create yourself. You did not breathe into your lungs the breath of life. So, Brother McCain, what we are doing is we are uh, appropriating, if you will, and we are taking what is not really ours and we are making it our own in this life. Everybody with me so far? We're taking what does not belong to us and then we put our spin on it. We put our uh, fingerprint on it, if you will. And so, we are able to do this and we are given the option to do so 
really in a non-derogatory sense. And most of the time when you take something that doesn't belong to you and you make it your own, well, they call that stealing. <laughs> right? That's what they call it. You take something that's not yours and you, uh, you know, call that stealing. But in this sense, the Lord gives us the opportunity to take what does not belong to us, our life, and He gives us the freedom to live our lives. Okay? Any way that we decide to live them. So, in order to appropriate something, if you will, in our daily walk in Christ, there are two essentials, okay? To see what is already ours in Christ, you can write this down if you wish, to see what we already have in our lives in Christ Jesus, and it is essential that you and I are aware of our need for it. So look at all the things you have in Christ right now in your life. Think about all the things that you can count as your own, so to speak, in this life. And then look at how essential that it is that you are aware of your need for these things in your life. So really what I'm telling you tonight is that on these two factors rest the ability to appropriate the reason why I can take this life and that does not belong to me and make it my own is because, you ready? Jesus Christ gave me this life right. with other things. And then I realize and I'm aware of my need for Jesus Christ in my life. Yeah. Okay? So that's how I can do it. I can reach a place with steadfast faith. I can receive that which belongs to me through the Lord Jesus Christ. So plainly, we need Jesus in our lives. And to, to say it even more plainly, we need to live this life as He requires. Now, has anybody ever borrowed someone's car? Anybody here ever done that? You borrowed someone's car? You, you know, I need to borrow your car from you. And they, you know, give you keys. And, uh, you know, one thing I, I never liked about uh, rental cars back in the day, you'd get into a rental car, and if it was an old rental car, that thing smelled like all kinds of stuff. It smelled like an ashtray. It smelled like... Sometimes alcohol. Just smell like just about anything. You know what I'm saying? And so, when you get your car, and you loan it out to somebody, you know, I've even had people say, you know, uh, well, when I loan my car out to people, I make sure that nobody, eat, don't eat fast food in my car. Because it leaves a smell. I don't want any french fries to fall down between, yeah. you know, the seat. And, which is yeah. not a worry with me. Because when I eat, I, I don't you drop food. It all goes in the right spot. <laughs> Spot, obviously. Don't have to worry about drop fries when I'm around. Because if I drop it, I'm just going to pick it up, you know, steer with my knee. And, no, I'm just or am I? So here's the thing. A lot of people say, well, you can borrow this, but this is what you have to do. This is how you have to treat it because it's not yours. It doesn't belong to you. You're not on the uh, insurance. You're not on the, you know, on the title. And so it doesn't belong to you. Folks, this life we live, it does not belong to us. Right. And so we need to drive it as God tells us to drive it. Amen. If He says, don't do this, we need to not do this. Right. If He says, don't do that, guess what? We don't need to do that. And I want you to understand that the idea of simply asking somebody, Sister Jeannie, to do something in their life that is sacrificial or to live a certain way that is completely opposite of what they're used to or what their flesh is used to, uh, in example, leaving, leading an apostolic lifestyle, that is a tall order to ask. You know, back in the day, when you became apostolic, well, this is the way that it is. When you became apostolic, these are the list of do's and these are the list of don'ts. This is how you need to live, right here. You find yourself and you live. But here's the thing. We have to consider that even though you become apostolic, that those things required of you after the Word of God, it goes against your fleshly nature. 
It doesn't feel good to the flesh. Now that doesn't mean that we do away with it. What it means is we have to educate people on how to live that way. And hopefully this Bible study and the Bible studies hereafter will help accomplish that. I want you to consider for a minute the Apostle Paul. Write down in your notes if you will. Write this down. The Apostle Paul, and you can kind of you know, shorthand it if you want. But the Apostle Paul, in the first three chapters of Ephesians, doesn't ask one thing of the saints. In the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, he doesn't ask Brother Barry anything of the saints. What he does is he expounds on the wondrous stories of the great eternal facts that's concerning them. He tells them in three chapters all of the good, wondrous things of God and living of God. And when he finishes his catalog of realities, if you'll let me put it that way, it's not until then does he ask them to do anything at all. And so when he does finally open his plea for their higher walk, he says, now, now my, remind, let me remind you, he's getting ready to ask them to step to a higher level. He's getting ready to ask them to live in a way that is different from the way that they've been living. Now watch very carefully. He does everything and asks them to do this based on the revelation before given the facts of their high character and their destiny as saints. So he spends three chapters, Brother Jamal, saying this, you got that, and here's who you are. He talks about all this, again, this catalog of wondrous things of God. He doesn't ask them to do a single thing. But then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 1, write this down, or it might be even on your paper, I don't know. Ephesians, I don't think it's on your paper. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 1, here's what he says. Are you ready? He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. Think about that. He said, I'm asking you to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. He spends three chapters telling them what all they get in Christ, who they are in Christ. And then in chapter 4, verse number 1, he says, Now, you need to live according to all that you've been given. Everybody with me? You need to live according to all that you've been given. So, Paul is stating, look at all the wonderful things that the Lord's done for you and what you are and what you have in Him and through Him. And then he says, walk worthy. What does that mean to walk worthy? To walk worthy means to represent the King. To represent God. Here's what he says. He says, represent, I beseech you, that you represent the king, that you act as children of the king. Now, this is not going to be a spot on analogy because we understand that we're human beings and we make mistakes and we also understand that it's not 110% what I'm about to say, but there is a strong, for example, if you're out in public and there's a family like mine, setting eating in a restaurant, at a table in a restaurant. And let's say that the entire time, let's say that they're just right across, across the way, you can see them. Let's say the entire time that they're eating, the kids are making a mess. And by making a mess, I'm not talking about just you know spilling something here. I'm talking about these kids <laughs> climb out of the devil's backyard. <laughs> And they're throwing things. They're screaming. They're fighting. They're down in the chairs. They're running around. Running around. And I know, look, i got two five-year-olds. I know exactly what some of that's all about. But I'm talking about malicious, evil children. And they're messing with everybody's table. And they're spilling stuff on purpose. And they're throwing food. And I want you to imagine seeing this. Because I know we've seen this before. You're sitting there looking at them. And the parents are eating. And they're barely doing anything. Now, you get angry at the children. You look at that and you go, you know what? If that was my kid, I'd be peeling the hide right off that. I'd be tearing them up. That's what you keep 
that's what you're saying. But you know what it is, though? It's really a reflection on the parents, isn't it? Right. Amen. I mean, they're a five-year-old child. Yeah. And they've all got that devil bred into them. Okay? It's going to happen. But you, you don't say, oh, I feel sorry for those parents. You don't. You walk away saying, I don't know what's wrong with them. I can't believe they what? Let their children act that way in public. You are a reflection and you are an example of your heavenly Father that you represent. If you in any way, shape, or form claim to be tied to Him, you have to walk worthy as children of the King or, as Paul said, ambassadors for Christ. So, Paul calls it a calling. He said, this calling, and it is a calling, takes total commitment and devotion. It takes consecration on the highest level. And to do this and achieve this accurately, here's what we have to learn how to do. Sister Margie, we got to learn how to deny ourselves and to be crucified with Christ. Amen. Deny yourself, become crucified with Christ, and then are you ready? Then you've got to act out this life with the actions of Jesus Christ. Turn if in with, with me in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, hopefully you do. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 9. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 9. I believe this is on your paper, but we're going to be looking at several scriptures tonight. So, Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 1 and verse number 9. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 9. Thou hast loved righteousness. Everybody say, I love, I love righteousness. And hated iniquity. Everybody say, I hate iniquity. I hate iniquity. Therefore, God, watch, even thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So, because you love righteousness and you hate sin, the Lord anoints you with the oil of gladness. Look at John chapter 3 and verse number 34. Turn and look at John chapter 3 and verse number 34. In just a few minutes, we're going to get into some things that I hope will just kind of change your mind, turn your mind around, whip it around a few times. John chapter 3 and verse number 34. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Here's what that scripture said. When it came to Jesus, he did not have a measure of the Spirit. The Bible says that God is a what? Spirit. Try it again. God is a? Spirit. Yes. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what the Bible says. Okay? Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. So Jesus Christ on this earth did not have a measure of the Spirit of God. He was the Spirit of God by Right. Okay? The scripture says, For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto Him. Now I want you to listen very carefully. The Spirit is given by measure to you and I. Sister Jessica, when I was filled with the Holy Ghost, I wasn't filled with all the Holy Ghost in the whole wide whatever. I, I couldn't contain it. Okay? I could not contain it. And furthermore, Brother Barry, I was only given a measure of it to keep me going because it is God's plan for me to stay attached to it and to desperately seek that filling, refilling, infilling every time I pray. Right. These people that say, well, you know, uh, and, and I'm not saying you have to speak in tongues a certain amount of times in your whole life. I'm not saying that. But folks, I'm going to tell you something. When you feel the Holy Ghost and you begin to speak in other tongues, that's a good thing. Because that's that Holy Ghost. Another measure coming back in. And I know about you, but whenever I leave getting up from praying, or I leave a service, and I've spoken tongues, and the Holy Ghost has spoken through me, it's like a recharge in my batteries. You don't do that, and you know, you let several weeks and months go by, or even years go by, and folks, you just got to imagine, you're going to get a little stale. Or a lot of stale. So you have to pray because God gives it to us by measure. But understand this. 
Jesus had a measure, or not a measure, but he had all of it, not by measure, of power. He had all the wisdom. He had all the, uh, uh, the knowledge. And so Jesus was infinite in all of his capabilities. When it came to power, Jesus had all power. When it came to wisdom, he had all wisdom. When it came to knowledge, Jesus had all knowledge. Now let me ask you a question. When I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, and I, I receive a measure of the Spirit of God, and I become saved, I'm baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'm saved. I have to work and labor and continue to be saved. But when I act like the one who saved me, His power then is able to be demonstrated through me. Amen. We're going to get to it in a minute. Paul said, now it's no more I, but it's Christ that lives in me. Right. You know why he said that? Because if I'm doing it by myself, I'm limited. Amen. Right? Amen. If I'm doing it on my own, I'm limited. But if Jesus Christ is able to work through me and in me, then it's not me, it's God. It's amazing to me how many folks claim that they live for God and in their everyday lives they barely do anything like the Lord Jesus Christ. They think because they go to church on Sunday and Wednesday that that's all there is to look, look, look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 13. Turn with me there. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 13. Because if you'll allow it, the Scriptures will speak to you. And I want you to do that. I want you to let the, the, the Scriptures speak to you and talk to you and tell you what God wants you to do. Amen. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 13 says, For it is God which worketh in you. Who's working in you? God. Who's working in you? God. To, watch this, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. That scripture just told me, Brother Jamal, that God's working in me to will or to want to. Everybody say, I've I got to have the want to. And, Brother Hines' word, to do His good pleasure. So here's what that means. God works in you. You work because God works in you. You know what that is? That's total surrender. Listen, I can tell the difference when somebody preaches or teaches and they let all God work in them. I can tell when somebody's singing a song or playing and they're letting all of God work in them and through them. There's a huge difference. And then you've got those that preach or teach or sing or play or do whatever, and they're not doing it because God's working in them or through them. They're doing it because it's about 50% God and 50% they want to show up. 50% they just want everybody to see how awesome they are. Folks, that's not total purpose. That is not total consecration. But many Christians misunderstand this. Now I want you to follow close. If you're going to fall asleep, don't do it right here. Okay, follow closely. A lot of people misunderstand this. They think because they have the will to do it. Let me give you an example. Raise your hand if you want to work for God. Okay. We're going to talk about that in a minute too. Raise your hand if you want to, if you've got the will, you've got the desire to do something great for the kingdom of God. Raise your hand one more time. Okay. Everybody here, you've got the will. But I want you to understand something. To have the will is not enough. You've got to have the ability to do it. Everybody say, I have to do it. Have to do it. Now, this new will, when you become saved, is a, it's a permanent gift. It is an attribute of the new nature. Before you met God, before you got baptized, before you got the Holy Ghost, you probably had zero desire to do anything for the kingdom of God. But what happens when you become a new convert? What's everybody say? You get a bunch of new converts in here, and they'll out-pray people. They'll out-worship people. A new convert will run the aisles more than somebody who's been here for 25 years. A new convert will teach more Bible studies. Why? Because when you get baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, this new will of the new life comes in you, and it has all the zeal you could ever imagine. Right. You, if you can bottle it up, 
and everybody drinking on Sunday, we tear these walls down every Sunday night. Amen. Seriously. I mean, when you think about it, that's that new will. And that is a permanent gift. But here's what you've got to understand. The new will, the new desire to work for God, that is a new gift. But the ability to do is not a permanent gift. You're not always going to have the ability to do. Now, when you're a new convert, okay, when you're a new convert, you're pumped, you're excited, you're like, woo, you're ready to go, man, I'm telling you, you're ready to take on the world. And about 50% of that is spirit, and the other percent of that is you because that's your flesh. You're gonna, but guess what's going to happen after a while? Your carnal nature is going to take over, and you're not going to have the want to anymore. Amen. Right. You're going to be in this thing so long, you're just going to let somebody else do it for a while. I've been carrying it alone for so long, let somebody else do it. You know what that is? Your will is still there, but your to-do is not there. Right. Right. Okay? Everybody with me? All right. Now, it is the man who is conscious of his own inconsistencies as a believer who will learn that it's the Holy Spirit of God that leads him into a holy life. There's two motives I want to talk to you about in just a minute. There is a love motive and there is a life motive. So write that down. There is a love motive and a life motive. Okay? Two Motives. You may not be able to, to right off the bat understand which one I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about here, but let's look at this. The love motive that you have from which to live the Christian life and serve the Lord. Everybody that's here tonight, if I, and I'm not going to do it, but if I said, raise your hand if you love God, you'd be ignorant enough to raise your hand. Everybody here loves God. <laughs> and, and the amazing thing is, is that not until, Brother Dean, did I really start studying this stuff out, did I realize that I'm, I'm not saying I've been wrong, but I've not had it all together for, for most of my life in looking for this. You know, everybody, I've even heard people say, I serve God not because I'm scared of hell, it's because I love the Lord. Let me tell you something. You think you're sitting on these pews because you love God. Love might have put you on these pews. Yeah. Right? Amen. But love doesn't always keep you on these pews. Now, now, watch. There's a love motive for living for God, and then there is a life motive. Love motive is high. I mean, it is. I'm not diminishing the, the, the motive of love at all. But the love motive is not adequate. Here's what I mean. In a marriage, there's times that you feel anything but love for your spouse. There's times when you're faced with challenges, oh, you love them, but you've got so many other things going on, you just can't muster that up. So what holds you then? What keeps you then? You have to find the motivation to live for God that is underwritten by God. Are you ready? Here it goes. God living through you, this is how he lives. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loved, but God loving wasn't enough. Right? The only way that you and I could ever come into the graces of God was for him to do what? To give. What if God would have looked down on the, on the earth, Brother Dean, and said, Oh, I love them. That, his love for them isn't what saved us. It's when His love took action that it saved us. Again, you say you love me. Show me that you love me. Right? right. I'm going to tell you what, the word love is thrown around so much these days, people don't even know what it means. Amen. Hollywood has made love nothing but lust. And nobody knows what love is anymore. Amen. Here's what love is. Love sticks with you in your worst moment. Amen. Love gives when nobody else will. Right. So as growing Christians, it is time for you and I to see the necessity of going beyond the love motive. Don't just come to church because you love God. Come to church because you want to live for God. That's right. Amen. Right? Okay. Here's... Philippians 1 and 21, you don't have to turn there. You can write this down. 
Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Brother Barry, he didn't say for me to love is Christ. He said for me to live is Christ. The only way that any, I don't care what every church, listen, there's churches out in this world right now that are not apostolic churches. They're liberal, they're, they're new, they're relevant, they're whatever you call them. And here's what they say. Oh, we're showing the love of Christ. We're showing the love of Christ. You know what you're talking about the love of Christ. And just because you feed the poor, and just because you build houses for people that don't have homes or that are living in the streets, all that stuff is good and all that stuff is kind and all those things are Christian. But you got to understand, you are not showing the Lord that you love Him because you build somebody a house or you feed the poor. What you're doing is showing them kind, the kindness of Christ. But I fear that so many times, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel so many times, Brother Jamal, that we leave the Lord Jesus in the dust when we're trying to do everything benevolent for everybody else. Right, right. You want me to prove that to you in Scripture? Okay, I will. I don't even have it written down. But if you notice, whenever I, I believe it was in the setting where Mary poured the oil on Jesus' feet and they was rebuking her, and, and, and Judas said, that money could have given to be given to the poor. What did Jesus say to Jesus? Judas, he said, the poor you have with you always. But she has reserved this for me. For my burial. So the question is, what have you reserved? What have you set back as your life? When Mary broke that box at Jesus' feet and poured that oil on, him, on his feet, you know what she was pouring out on him? Her life. Her life. Her love bought the oil. Her love saved the oil. But it was her life and her desire to live that broke the box. And that dumped it out. For Mary so loved that she gave. Everybody with me? Alright. Turn with me to Romans chapter 7 and verse number 18. Romans 17 verse number 18. Now listen. Our consecration to the Lord. Our surrender. Our commitment. Will never hold up if it is our responding to Him for any other motivation than a life motive. Now we got to see this. Yielding to God. Yielding to a life of Jesus. On any different basis. Will simply amount to you living for God with a self life. Everybody say, no, it's not shelf life, it's self life. Life. Everybody say self life. self life. Here's what a self life is. Self life is when it's my life. I'm living for God because I want to. Or I'm going to sing because that's what I want to do for God. Okay? Well, listen, for years, but Jamal, for years, I think I've had this just complicated. I think I've had this kind of fuzzy. And, and, I've, and just as I'm studying this, you know, and to teach to you, I'm kind of coming across some new stuff here. It's kind of, it's kind of interesting to me because all my life I've said things and, and, and done things and it's like blowing me away. I'm looking at this and I'm like, wait a minute. You know, I say that I'm living for God because I love Him. But, but it's different. Listen, I can't offer anything to God in my self-life. You want to know why? Because even if it were possible, my self-life is in the flesh. Listen, God does not accept anything from the old man. Right. The way you used to be, God doesn't accept that. That's why He makes you a new creature when you come to Him. So, the old life passes away. God doesn't want to have anything to do with your old life. Right? Amen. Your old mentality, your old ideas, your old idea. God doesn't want to have nothing to do with that. He want, that's why He gives you a new life. And your motive is everything. So, do you want to become consecrated on every level because you love Him and you feel that it's owed to Him? Because if that's what you're doing, you will fail. Let me be the first one to tell you. If the only reason why you're living for God and you want to be consecrated is because you love Him and you, you feel like you owe Him, you're going to fail. Jesus doesn't want you to pay Him back. Because you can't pay Him back. Nobody here can pay Him back. Never. Never. Will you ever be able to pay him back? So then what does he want? He doesn't want you to live for him just because you love him. He wants you to live for him because you have a life motive. Listen, if I don't have the right motive, everything I do for God will be based upon my own strength. Does anybody here, can anybody here say that your strength can make it through to heaven? No. You know you can't. No. So why do we try? 
Why, Brother Dean, do we try? You know what? I, I'm bringing about, and I hope you're getting this, because I'm bringing about a revelation to you that I believe the Lord has shown to me, that if we'll begin to help people, people won't backslide every time they make a mistake. Amen. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. People won't quit and give up on church and give up on God and give up on their families every time they stumble and fall. When they get up and look in the mirror and say, well, no wonder I fell. It's because my motive is wrong. I need to live the life and not just love the life. Amen. That's what I need to do. And so, let's look at it. we got to understand that if this is truly His life, then I need His power moving and acting through me, and I'll be successful. Romans 7 and 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Somebody said the old man. Oh, now watch this. We talked about will. Remember we talked about to will and then we talked about to do. Listen to what he says. Paul says, for to will is present with me. Now watch. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. You know what Paul just said? Paul just said, I want to do it. But when I try to find out how to go about doing it, live the life. I can't find it. I look around. To will is present with me. Well, why can't you find it, Brother Roney? Look at the first part of the scripture. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh. Paul says, as long as you're looking at yourself, your self-life, your flesh, Paul says, no good thing is in you. But when you see how to perform it by His power, I can love how to appropriately act it out and initiate that love is it's, it's hard to find. Now watch how this opens up. Turn to Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. I, I have to hurry. I'm not going to get the bench. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Watch. I'm crucified with Christ. Everybody say the old man dies. Amen. 